I'd like to call the Middlesex County Board of Supervisors to order. At this time, Reginald Williams, could you lead us in prayer, followed by Matt Walker for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, let us close our eyes in prayer. For oh, grace of God, our Father, we come once again to this place. Father, be with us now as we take county business, Father. Teach us, Father, that we all are neighbors trying to do for one cause. In Jesus' name, we all do pray. Amen. 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 Would all citizens rise and join me in the flag of the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on, on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda, which consists of meeting agendas for February the 4th, which, which was a budget work session. February the 4th, and again, was a regular, uh, regular meeting. And then February the 7th was a budget work session. And then February the 11th was a joint budget work session with the school board disbursement and payroll. Do we have any corrections? Additions to the consent agenda. If not, we have a motion to approve. So uh, we, have, we have motion. Motion to approve. Approved by John, second by Pete. Yes. We have a motion. They've been properly second. Any more discussion? All in favor of that motion, show by the sign saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. None opposed. Next would be public comment. At this time, would anyone like to address the board? Come on, Come on up to the mic. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michelle Putman. I'm from Deltaville, and I'm here on behalf of the Garden Club of the Middle Peninsula. And I hope I'm here today to bring you something cheerful and nice. Um, I'm here to speak about uh, Historic Garden Week. I think you all have a book and a brochure in front of you. Um, this year, uh, the Garden Club of the Middle Peninsula is a <coughs> chapter of the Garden Club of Virginia. Uh, and every year is Historic Garden Week. It typically takes place the third week of April, and it runs throughout the state. Uh, this year is the centennial, and it happens to come to Middlesex. It's our turn. Each year, the counties of uh, uh, the Middle Peninsula take turns. We're comprised of King William, King and Queen, Essex, and Middlesex. Uh, so this year, much of it will take place here in Saluda. Uh, the Jones House will be featured, as well as Leafwood. Uh, and Southern Size on 17 is one of the properties, as well as the Swinehart House. Uh, this is the Centennial, so we're, we may be bringing some traffic to town. We're hoping to have some off-duty uh, deputies helping to direct traffic. Last year, we had nearly 700 people visit the ex uh, Essex tour. So uh, it's a good chance to put Saluda and Middlesex uh, in the, to showcase our town. And um, we uh, look forward to working with everyone. And we'll uh, have more publications coming. So just wanted to give you all a heads up about that. All right, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? For public comment, come up this time. I've talked about this in the past, and I'll do so in the future until you solve it. I know there's a sophisticated amplification system back there. <coughs> this is hooked to it. Your microphones are hooked to it. So those people out there can hear what you're saying. But the way it's adjusted now, And I think maybe he has the talent, skill, to look at it, figure it out, and make the adjustments. I thank you kindly. Kevin, can you adjust a little bit more? Volume, or is it already set? It's, it'll feedback. It'll, it'll feedback. feedback. Well, I've, okay. I've worked with it a number of times. Okay, all right. I just want to know, make sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we need to speak into our mic. Yeah, speak, just speaking in the mic a little louder and get closer to the mic because uh, I was if we set that. it up, it's going to be, you know, set, it, set the volume up and get feedback, and that's just as bad. So if you can speak into the mic closely, okay. then everyone can hear you. How's this? 
Wonderful. Everybody in the back, raise your hand if you can hear me. <laughs> I'm Monica Sanders, and uh, I'm from Topping, Virginia. Um, I had two things. Uh, one is I did ride along with the Sheriff's Department. I went with the Deputy Christie. She's very professional. But I, here's what I found out that is really interesting. She is really the sole deputy to, to go up and down the whole county, and she does have a supervisor. And he does a lot of paperwork and so forth and delivers papers, and she does as well. Plus, she does the, the dog stuff. And we went up and down the county several times. And uh, she's really busy all day, just, just her. But if we ever had a crisis, we've only got one, really, rolling around here. So I think that maybe giving Sheriff Bushy something else to, to, to work with. There's supposed to be, I think, two more deputies you know coming on board and uh, that would be really helpful the second issue that I have uh, had to do with the two electric buses that the school board wants and I think there's there's no such thing as a line item veto like there isn't in Congress but anyway uh, the two buses are one twice as expensive as regular buses and I know there's a grant with this but a single charge for the bus, and I've talked to a mechanic about this and he gave me this information, goes 134 miles. Well, let's suppose you have kids on the bus and you have to stop for some reason, a big wreck, maybe the bus, maybe just you're in the way. You know, how long is that bus gonna hold up while they're keeping the kids on the bus? Do we get, we have a really big county here and we have a lot of ways to go. The second thing is the cost of the charging stations, I think, is about $900 a piece. And I, I, while I like the upward technology, I think it's really a bad idea to kind of do it now. I think that maybe that might be a little, you know, you can, even though they're going to raise the gas tax, it's still cheaper to put gas in a bus. And if it stops on the side of the road, you can bring a can. <laughs> But you can't do it with an electronic bus. And that was mainly what I wanted to say. And thank you very much. Do we have anyone else for public comment? Good afternoon. I'm Trudy Feagum from the Hartfield District. You're right in the middle or just about toward the end of your budget session. And the county has needs <coughs> and this county has a lot of wants. And I know it's going to be on all of your shoulders to decide which is which. What are the needs? What are the wants? We know there's going to be a ton of mandates unfunded coming down from the General Assembly. And in many cases, they're open-ended. We're not exactly sure all of what's going to be involved, how much we're going to be on the line to pay. I am always excited to see us on the edge of new technology and innovation. And with that being said, I looked at those electric school buses, exciting that Middlesex County would be used to test those and to make sure that they all work. But at the expense that they're projecting that will ultimately fall back on the county, I'm questioning whether or not that's the best idea to do at this point. I didn't go to the public hearing for the school board, and I apologize for that. But I also think that it's important that they take a look at this too, as needs as opposed to wants. Is it going to make a difference for one single student's education if we don't replace all of the new smart boards, for example. If we could get by using what we have and not have to worry about buying all brand new at this point, it just makes sense that at this point we're looking at how we can save some dollars because we're going to be on the line for way too much. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Do we have anyone else that would like to address the board? If not, public comments close. Next on the agenda is the Constitutional Officer, Treasurer, 
Kathy Thrift. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a few things we do, I'm sure you've seen, where we're going to have a sale. Mm -hmm. We'll be right here in this room on uh, Thursday, March 12th at 1 o'clock. We do have packets in my office. It shows all, it's 51 properties at this point. Mm -hmm. We have a packet that shows everything, the pictures, everything that's been done on those properties that they have checked. So if you're interested in one, we can get it for you. Um, Delinquent personal property bills will be going out Friday. Delinquent real estate's going out on Monday. We have had uh, good success with the debt set off this year. Last year we did not have a good success with that, but we have, we've collected, we haven't collected, we've gotten notified of over 100 people so far we have matched with. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't do that much last year for the whole year. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're gonna, get quite a bit of money. Right. Of course, we don't get the money from the state, but once a month, the 15th of the month on the state taxes. Okay. okay. Would anybody have any questions? Treasurer? Yeah. Is that what you held up? Is that what was on the back page of the Southside Sentinel? This it is. Week? It is the, the listing of the properties? list, but it also uh -huh. has um, aerial pictures, uh -huh. shows all the map numbers, mm -hmm. everything that could possibly, who the owners are, the addresses. <coughs> so if you're interested, we have them over there. Thank you. Okay. How often are you conducting sales like this typically? How often? Yeah. Like, is this once a year, once every it's five years, <laughs> twice a year? Yeah, once a year, we hope. Yeah. I hope, <laughs> intend to, anyway. In your uh, treasurer's tax collection report, is there a simple way that you can show month over month, like to show us the static snapshot of where it is right now is helpful? Mm -hmm. But to put that in context of maybe the previous month or six months ago, because I realize the various taxes come in at different times in the year. Right. So at one point you might have a tax that shows a 67% collection rate, which if you don't know better says, wow, we're way behind. But that happens to be something that you've only just been collecting for a month or two. Is there a way to revise the report to sort of reflect, uh, you know, make the obvious explanation for why something would, would appear low if you didn't have all the information. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank I you. We'll see what we can do about that. Anything else? Anyone else? Well, that's it for me. Thank you, Kath. You're welcome. Take care. And then we have uh, the Commission of Revenue. I know May Burke is not here. <coughs> yeah, the information she, there. She sent a, a very short report that's at your At your at desk? Your okay. I missed that. <coughs> all right. Next on uh, uh, the agenda is the agency and staff report. VDOT, Joyce McGowan. And while she's coming up, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just want to highlight uh, the Commissioner of Revenue did point out in her report that tax relief for the elderly and disabled has been adjusted for inflation. So that was something that we had asked for so that that, that number was relevant to current data. Oh, so that, that, that's a good, that's good report. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, you have your board report for March. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, we are having a um, pre-construction meeting for the Route 17 project over Dragon Run the end of March, um, end of this month, actually, time pause. Um, and so we're expecting that project to start in the next four to six weeks after um, we have that meeting with the contractor. So um, 17 southbound below Hardy's, the bridge that goes across into Gloucester will be reduced to one lane um, and we will monitor and traffic and, and all that, but it will remain closed to one lane. It's not going to reopen until the bridge is completed. Um, so for the duration of the project, there'll be one lane of traffic headed south. Um, so I want to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, we're still on schedule for Route 625 over Barracks Pond to replace the bridge there um, in August. Um, that will probably involve some closures as well. Um, and um, there was some ditching that was requested on 612 and 693 that's been completed. And um, while we're um, on that subject, we're going to move into um, five um, routes, 603, 613, 629, 616, and 17 for ditching as well. Um, and we also reviewed three site plans in the county and issued two permits through our land use um, department. Um, I don't have any other 
updates. Um, I think there's some, um, let me make sure I didn't make any notes for anything else. I apologize. I think I have all my notes, right? Yep. Nothing else as far as updates on what's going on in the county, and I can take any questions you may have. Uh, on on this, uh, we had the consideration for the uh, redistrict re of the truck the traffic from Horseshoe Bend, Delta Bill. Do you have anything on that? Um, I do. I've, I've been contacted by a um, business owner um, about through trucks, I guess, um, a through truck, not a through truck restriction. I was contacted by a citizen who had concerns about um, vehicles making deliveries to their business. Um, I think you're talking about Timberneck and Horseshoe Bend. Lud can um, tell you more about Lud, yeah, Lud Delta has the, the piece yeah. of it. So I've talked to them. I've talked to Lud. Um, we've talked, um, I guess, amongst ourselves in the office. And um, I don't know what questions you may have for me on all of that. I, I spoke with Ron yesterday, and he let me know that you all had talked about that. And for everybody else's understanding, the um, there are full-size tractor trailers with loads of things like steel beams that are 30 and 40 feet long that are headed out to Stingray Point need to turn onto Timberneck Road to make deliveries to Miller uh, Marine for boat construction. There are also full-size trailers with large boats that are being delivered to Norton <coughs> Yachts down that same road. If they miss the turn or if they have a very outdated uh, information system in their truck, then they will go and try and turn on Horseshoe Bend Road, which comes to a T at a, at a intersection that they cannot navigate with a full-size tractor trailer. And one vehicle turned over with a $100,000 piece of equipment on it. Other vehicles have gotten stuck in ditches and had to back up on um, residential properties in order to try and get around the turn. So what we would like to do is have a uh, essentially a sign that closes the road to through truck traffic so that we don't have another accident or have these vehicles get stuck in residential properties again. And we would, uh, and so as I understand it, Joyce, the process is for us to determine if we accept having that road closed to through truck traffic, at which point I think we have to do a study and then you do something and then it happens, yep. is that right? Yeah, um, so we um, talked about this, I guess we, we were looking at um, the roadway. There are um, a couple of things that I would kind of put out, I guess, when you have um, these type of situations, this is not a through route. Um, the route actually dead ends on the other side of Timberneck and Timberneck dead ends on the other side. So it's not your typical through truck restriction like we have at Regent um, where we have um, from 33 to 3, you can't take your trucks through there unless you have a destination. Um, but the Code of Virginia um, does have a code section. It's 46.2-809. Um, and it does um, provide that the local governing body can do a study, public hearings, public input, and come up with um, their decision. If they choose, they can send that resolution to choose to do a no through truck restriction. You send it to the department and we present it to our Commonwealth Transportation Board. In between all of that, we would have traffic engineering look at it um, to make sure it is a viable um, restriction and that there aren't any other things that we could do to, you know, eliminate the issue of the driver's GPS taking them to the next reasonable route, which is what it's doing. I'm assuming it's re, re, re local. What did they used to say? That little thing used to tell you re rerouting. Re rerouting. Um, but it'll tell it reroutes them <coughs> to that next road. There are signs um, that um, these no through truck signs, when they go up, it will restrict all the vehicles to go. We would probably just from looking at it from our conversations restrict we probably recommend from 33 to Timberneck you wouldn't want to do from Timberneck to the dead end um, because people could come down Timberneck and make that right and do do well um, so um, anyway so that's kind of what we would do probably because it's new and the board is just I guess learning about it I can get our folks to maybe do some of that research up front to make sure it's a reasonable request um, to make sure there's nothing else that we're missing. Um, we have looked at it. Um, 
when she or the request was made last year um, so I can I can definitely do that um, one of the things um, there is off-premise advertising there are no wayfaring wayfinding signs um, for the businesses down in that area that they come off of Timberneck so if there was some way to maybe put some directional signs that say such and such this way or, or that you know that that might be something that could be explored as well before you know the board takes action um, while we're doing our research and report too so um, but it is allowed it falls upon the board to do the work and the research we can help with the traffic piece um, but once you do make that um, request to the CTB our Commonwealth Transportation Board they have nine months to act on it which they usually don't take nine months um, but sometimes they are controversial and there are issues so um, anyway yes it can be done um, I'm gonna leave um, a book with everybody I didn't get a chance to give these out if that's okay, um, okay. Let's expect that. Thank you. yeah um, well, it, 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 it's a whole little Reader's Digest version on it, um, but hopefully I answered the question. Um, but um, <coughs> we can we can make that review if you'd like us to to kind of give you an idea of what it would look like or what you should consider um, for the no through truck restriction based on what we have. If you wanted to pursue it further after you've exhausted all of your other options, with you know yeah. looking and at it. And I would it. request to the board that we do that. Yes. It's a lot of information. Can you Did clarify the request for the Commonwealth's attorney? The I'm sorry, I just didn't hear it. I got, I'm so excited. Hey, y'all, thank you. I'm always printing this off. So thank you. Yeah. What was the request again? The, that if you would like, if you, this is not a usual request because usually the people that live on the roadway are the people who are. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that called me. Are making the request. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so I'm not sure. Um, with, with one that goes like through to another place this is a through but it's it stops <coughs> it, it's it stops short of going to another um, major roadway so it is possible to do it but I was would um, could offer us to look through to make sure there isn't anything that we could do to help or to, to, to identify any other things that would be helpful before you took that step and it sounds like that's normal procedure is to do that right we don't we usually you usually would do all of the other and then we would review it but in in light of that knowing we're going to do it on the back side then we could probably do it up front to that, sit, that way you could we could really nail down what we're doing and why we're doing it and what other things could be done because there is directional signage for other businesses off premise um, that are out there for other people and one of those you know other way those signs direct them down both roads um, so you know you have other people using the same road. both roads um, for getting people to where the, they the, need to the be the sign actually predates Timberneck going where it goes yes is, is so yeah so cleaning up some of that and, and maybe having something mm -hmm. different out there for everybody it doesn't fall under I looked through our um, we have a sign program um, that's called Virginia Logos, and um, if you have a, a bed and breakfast, a restaurant, um, things of that nature, you can have signs put up. The blue and white signs, um, typically you see them on the interstate, but you'll see them here just to get people to some of the out-of-the-way places. Um, I'm not sure that, I don't know which businesses would qualify for something like that versus going through our outdoor advertising office. Um, to see if there's some off-premise things they could do because um, I know the county has a sign ordinance as well that um, we'd have to work with but worth a, a look okay. so anything whatever the board wants to do I just wanted to offer up front to give you some more information I would certainly appreciate that it does is everybody okay with that yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Fine, We're okay with that. We can see that'll be fine. To Give me that. more time to look at it. Okay, all right. We'll <laughs> Again. Do Does anyone else have any more questions? One other question. No. The uh, 17 South uh, project starts in May. Uh, what's the duration anticipated? Um, I do believe 10 months is our goal for that. To have it done by next spring, March. hopefully sooner. Yep. Okay. Any more questions? Anything else? Not thank you, Joyce. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next is B School Matter, Dr. Peter Gretz. <coughs>
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got three pieces of uh, business to do with you, and I, I don't know what order they're in your packet, but I have two appropriation requests <coughs> and one budget transfer request. I'll pull them up, Okay. 32's first. 20. Okay. 20, 32's first. I just want to make sure I go over the, the one that you're... Okay. So the first one is uh, the school security grant monies that are released to school divisions who are found eligible every year. We were not found eligible this past year because we've accessed it so many times. But there were school divisions that uh, did not spend all of their security money, and so that money went back to the state, and then they released it to those of us that didn't get it. We got this small portion, $6,400, and we're using it to upgrade some security cameras at the high school and Compass Academy. So that's the request for this money uh, coming through the state grant program to be appropriated for our use in that regard. And the second appropriation request is uh, basically taking rebates and refunds that have come through mainly insurance and vehicles and being able to appropriate those. Also money collected for fingerprinting and background checks. And then this is actually a categorical transfer to go from transportation because fuel is coming in. We're anticipating it's coming in a little lower than what we had budgeted. And to transfer this $24,000 into the maintenance and operation line uh, to handle some of the upgrades and maintenance items that we're doing right now. Well, uh, do we have a motion to approve the budget settlement request 2020-32 and then 2020-33? And also with the uh, budget transfer request form FY 2020-8. So moved. We had a motion. Do you have a second? Second. We have a second. Motion been properly second. Any more discussion? All in favor of that motion, so by sign saying aye. 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 None opposed. Motion so carried. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything for Dr. Gritz? I would like to say I did uh, attend uh, black history at the elementary school. It's very interesting, and the kids did a lot of a lot of good work there. Thank you. And yeah, uh, we appreciated you and uh, and Reggie and Betty, and yeah, there were lots of folks that were there. Thanks so much for being a part of that. Thank you. Not, thank you, Dr. Red. Social service uh, report only. That's on page sixty-nine and seventy-one. Next, we have D Economic Development Authority, Gordon White. Chairman Jesse, members of the board. I'm yeah, speaking to the mic loud so everybody can Yes, hear sir. Chairman Jesse, members of the board, I'm here really to bring attention to the resolutions that were adopted unanimously by the authority in support of uh, the campground, Bethpage Campground, and the and Hummel Field. Uh, <coughs> the board has uh, considerations of those, and we're not getting into the details, but we feel that they're too. Uh, good economic developments and they along with Blue Point uh, Campground are the largest private investments in the county since I've been on the authority which is 12 years and while we can't take any credit we can at least support them. Um, Cook's Corners as you know is still a work in progress and that would be an excellent I increase in the economic activity and therefore the tax base. Uh, we feel that uh, Middlesex needs to grow its economy simply to provide the tax base to support things the local government such as ours needs to do, especially with uh, unfunded mandates you know, on the horizon. Uh, larger jurisdictions with stronger economies are, are able to support many things that Middlesex is not able to. Uh, as we get ready for this year's federal census, we find the county's population has grown very little, if at all. The real estate market, which is the primary uh, source of county income, has not really recovered from the 2007-09 recession. In my own opinion, Middlesex can no longer afford to be quite as determinedly rural as it has been. We need to encourage sensible growth, which the campgrounds on Hummelfield appear to be good examples. We need to encourage a larger tax base to strengthen our county. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? Anyone have any questions for Gordon? All right. But thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Pete got the phone down. 
Next, we had a board of uh, equalization, regress, rate progress. I guess I pronounced it right. Because that's the How you doing, Ray? Fine, fine, thank you, sir. <coughs> I'm Ray Kateski, and, and for the last two boards of equalization, I was the chairperson. Uh, and our principal recommendation from those last two boards was that the county enact an ordinance uh, pertaining to the Board of Equalization. Uh, in, that, in my last report, which was January of 2018, the board consented and directed that the county attorney and I develop an ordinance. Now that was delivered to the board in the summer of 2018 she went on maternity leave. I was remiss in following up, and the board never took any action on it. Now, approximately a month ago, she did resurface that ordinance, and I believe it's in your hands. Uh, for those of you who may not remember that report in 2018, here's, a, here's another copy of it, and I knew that was, that was our report. And if you go to page two, you'll see the principal recommendation. And we were fortunate to have one of your supervisors on our board at that, at that time, Mr. Coons. I think I'm running out of copies. Okay, right. Thank you very much. We'll share. We'll share. Mm -hmm. On page two, the principal recommendation, as I say, it, yeah. The board in, in 2018 really, really went ahead with that recommendation, but I say we've had no action on it, but you now have a draft board of ordinance uh, before you, and I'm urging you to look at it, approve it, and enact this ordinance. Uh, send it out for public comment. Yeah. Now, the, the state code does allow this, by the way. State code will provide the composition of boards, procedures, etc. But it really, it really encourages county <clears throat> to go ahead and establish its own ordinance. And the, our present system really is a painting without a frame. It, it has no structure. Uh, when, when the appeal period is announced. The, uh, an individual calls into the commissioner revenues office uh, may or may not say uh, what's the problem with their assessment they indicate what what piece of property it is a name and then uh, and then we try to schedule them as best we can and, and that requires a 45 day wait uh, at a minimum uh, we end up throughout the year getting to a point in uh, in November where we cannot even accept anymore because we would violate the 45-day limit. We also had the pitfall the last time of being forced to meet in the middle of December and the board took an action that had to be nullified later because there was not a, what it did is it raised, which it has the power to do, it raised the assessment on a piece of property but there was not enough time for that property owner to appeal that decision. Uh, and so it had to be nullified. So, so in essence, there's considerable pitfalls involved uh, in allowing a board to go a year without any deadline for the submission of applications or a deadline for the completion of the board's action. And that's really the, sali the salient points of this ordinance before you or the establishment of a deadline for the submission of an application and a deadline for the completion of the board's actions. And those are generally April 1st is the deadline for submission and July 1st is the deadline for the completion of the board's actions. Uh, now I took a cursory glance at counties around us to see if they had representative ordinances and they do. And they're far they're far more stringent than what we're offering here. Uh, for instance, Gloucester says you have to apply by February 1st. You have to make application by February 1st, and the board's action has to be completed by April 30th. James City County says you must apply by February 15th, 
and then it gives the board 60 days thereafter to complete their action. Uh, King William says that you must apply within 45 days of, of, of having been seen by the assessing officer and the board has to complete its action by April 1st. Across, across the bay here, Accomac has a March 15th deadline and April 15th is the deadline for the board's action. I go on and on, Goochland is another example. So there are, there are several examples of counties who have taken this action. Yeah. And really the, sal the salient points of this ordinance are, we establish a deadline for both actions, the application process and for the completion of the board's actions. Think of the situation now. Who supports it? The former Commissioner of Revenue, the for, uh, former Commissioner of Revenue, that is Mary Lou Stevenson and Bonnie Davenport, the present Commissioner of Revenue, and we also have support from the Treasurer's Office. Because think of the situation, the administrative burden that occurs to the Treasurer when we take an action in December and already there have been two tax bills that have been sent out to that to that landowner. So essentially I say we need structure, we need to build we need to build that framework, we need to put that frame around this this painting. Uh, it's time to, to provide it, avoid the pitfalls and the inefficiencies of our present process. Uh, and it's not harmful to any citizen. When you think of the, when you think of the process, <coughs> usually the assessor will complete their work by the end of October and inform the landowner, this is your new assessment. That person then has the, the right to appeal to the assessor. And normally that occurs in early November. So in, his, in that per, his or her's hands, if, if we establish this ordinance and put a deadline of, of 1 April on it, we've given that person five months to decide whether or not they want to, they want to appeal their assessment. And I, I think that's reasonable time, five months. And then the board would then have an additional two months to complete its action. No. Uh, as I say, it's supported uh, by the county offices it was the unanimous recommendation of the last two boards. Mr. Supervisor Kuntz, we didn't give him a chance to look at it because I knew he was already a supervisor and he could look at it from another viewpoint. But as I say, unanimous recommendation from all of the two last boards. Are there any questions? Anyone have any questions on this? I'm, I'm just curious, <clears throat> is our cycle we're doing assessments every three years? Four years. Every four, years. four years. We did the, so the one where I'm <coughs> referring to is 2016. In fact, actually, we should be in that cycle right now. So this is, this um, only applies really every four years? Yes. Or mm -hmm. yes. If, if you're in between assessments and you feel like something has happened to your property value, is that also a candidate for someone to appeal? No, not at this point. No? Okay. No. But if you're building or you're making improvements on your house, then the Commissioner of Revenue takes action <coughs> to increase that assessment. That's, that's a okay, Commissioner of so Revenue. Right. I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. But the official assessment done by an outside agency is done every four years or has been up to now. Mm. Yeah. But I think that the real salient point that Ray is highlighting is there are jurisdictions all around us that can do this process in 60 to 90 days. Um, the way we have it without the frame around the picture, it goes from February to November and it's hard to find people at $17 an hour to come in and make every one of those meetings and have a quorum. Uh, I think you said you met 17 times. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's onerous and it doesn't have to be and it's a pretty simple fix that's mm -hmm. already been done all around us. Yeah. So is there an ordinance for us to act on? Um, I prepared one and sent it to this board once and the previous board as well. I sent it to you on February 4th under a separate memo. But I have prepared it. Um, 
it's not in your packet today, but if you would like to send the draft that I sent to you under confidential memo dated February 4th, you can send that to public hearing or I can send it to you again and discuss it the next meeting. It would, it would be my preference that she resend it to all of us uh, with the intent of us reviewing it for uh, us to send it out to public hearing. For our next meeting. Correct. Yeah, yes, would you like that via, I typically use snail mail, is, would you prefer mail or email? I prefer email. email. It, it's not harmful to anyone, particularly when no. you know that they'll have five months to look at their assessment and determine in that time frame whether or not they want to appeal it. <clears throat> it makes perfect sense. Yeah, we just need to just need to act on it. All in the street, yeah, on there. I will have that to you before the end of the week. Okay. If not by tomorrow. <clears throat> Thank you. So did, did I understand that correctly? You're going to act at your next meeting to schedule the public hearing or schedule the public hearing for the next meeting? Oh, I, I took it as you want. Well, I'll let the board answer that. How? My preference would be to schedule the public hearing so that we can act on it in the next meeting. I think we're all going to find it fairly innocuous. It's in our inboxes. It's just there's, there's nothing nefarious here. Okay. Yeah, I, I mistook that. So you're that's gonna. How, that's how I took it. Okay. Yeah. So you well, want it on the April agenda for public yeah, hearing? Yeah, for public hearing. Yeah. <coughs> okay. In April. All right. Nobody have any questions. Yeah, All right. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. <coughs> Next uh, on the agenda is Healthy Harvest Food Bank. Paul, I'm going to mess your name, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have to tell me your last <laughs> name. <laughs> well, how do you pronounce your last name? Yeah. Shaka Tano. Shaka oh, Okay, all right. <laughs> Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Paul Shaka Tano, as we just said, and I'm the uh, chairman of the board of uh, Healthy Harvest Food Bank. And uh, we've been around for 10 years, and I could say I was one of the founding directors of uh, Healthy Harvest Food Bank also. And it's a pleasure to, to um, be able to address you for a moment this afternoon. Um, we do have a request in front of you for level funding of $1,000. And we're asking each of the six counties that we serve for a, uh, a minimal amount of $1,000 to help support our operations. Um, our, our actual operating budget is in the neighborhood of over $500,000 most of which is raised by donations. And when you uh, look at the breakdown, about uh, over $300,000 a year in operating funds from contributions, about 200000 in revenue streams. But with that, um, you, I, I provided with you an annual report. And if you open up to the center, the center fold, you'll find Middlesex County. And in, in the centerfold, you'll see that in this county, we serve about 1,671 of your residents through four partner agencies. And Paul, if I may, just for the record, this may be the only time Dave Cryer can be known of as a centerfold. <laughs> oh, that's a great one. Yeah, there he is. <coughs> um, and I don't think you'd want him to undress any more than he is. I agree. In this picture. <laughs> uh, Dave is one of our board members, actually. Um, and so uh, we distributed uh, la last fiscal year almost 377,000 uh, pounds of food uh, worth over $640,000. And we have uh, both uh, Backpack Buddy school programs and senior programs running in this county. And um, uh, we um, are, uh, I don't know if you, you know, but uh, our, our annual report will explain to you that we actually built a new headquarters building and warehouse in um, Warsaw this past year, which is in the center of our distribution network. And uh, our overall goal that I don't think I'll ever live to see will be to have health, healthy communities that run us out of business. Um, but uh, uh, in, in addition to distributing food, we're ready to start taking the next step in trying to further educate people that if we, if we give them a chicken, we don't want them to fry it. We want them to bake it. We want them to eat it healthy. We want them to barbecue it. 
and so we are getting um, more involved with programs uh, in conjunction uh, with the free health clinic uh, where we have at-risk folks for uh, heart disease and diabetes we, we are teaching them principles of healthy cooking and uh, and we've had some significant results with the three classes we've held in the last year in addition we're starting to work with children and um, our, our, one of our uh, visions is to have an, an aquaponics center where we combine fish harvesting with food harvesting mm -hmm. and to bring those children uh, primary school children in uh, have them plant some plants watch them grow harvest the food invite their parents in that share dinner with them with the idea of trying to open children's minds um, to careers, to different ways to look at life, uh, to healthy eating. And, um, and those are some of the things we hope to achieve over the next 10 years. Um, we come to you today as one of our six counties and we just request your support. Well, we'd like to thank you for that, Paul. Yeah. You know, it's great that, you know, you have a healthy eating for the whole Middle Peninsula right yeah. now with those programs. I know uh, we have to look at that in the budget, and uh, we'll get back with you on understand. that. Okay? Thank you for the time. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Regular agenda item, uh, special exception refund for Betty Muncie. What we got here? <coughs> between the packet and uh, which, what the request was it was actually what's in your packet is a request for a refund for for uh, an overpayment that was made by me mm -hmm. um, so that's that's an item that needs action on um, and then for $21 um, and, but what what was left out was the actual special exception refund request that's been put on your desk um, for I believe three hundred and fifty dollars, um, and you'll see the explanation for that that came What's along uh, that I got from the planning department. It came from a notice of violation, correct? I'm sorry. It came from a notice of violation. Right. Right. There was a notice of violation and um, sent to to a property owner, <coughs> and um, then they filled out a special exception application to um, have that use permitted. Um, and then, in the meantime, while that was being considered, a second violation was sent out uh, for a separate issue on the same property, and um, then they subsequently withdrew their application and they removed the violations so i mean but staff did review the application. staff did review so staff and did there was time involved in this yes but the the applicant has requested a refund of their well at this time we have refund. a motion for that for 300 350 dollars for a refund Uh, does everyone extend, uh, understand what went on with this situation? If you have more information, I'd, I'd be happy to hear it. I, no, I just have a little bit about it, but I don't know all of it, but I do know that uh, it was a container, and then when they went there, they found out that she had chickens that weren't supposed to be there. So when they had the chickens in the container, everything is moved and gone. They have, right. She so has. it's not there anymore. <laughs> it was a storage building, a container. That's, what, that's all it dealt with. And, and it was moved there and was in, wasn't in the right place. So she had to move it all and got it out the way. And, and she just won her um, refund back. Am I understanding is that right? Yeah. Because she's, everything she's was taken asked, care of. Right. After two, well, five, I, I, after I would two like violation to, notices were yeah. sent. They had to put yeah, some notices And in. staff time. So, right, right. So that's, that's up Did to the, the board. Did the chickens go in the container uh, or were the no, chickens it was, free? They had roosters. It wasn't chickens. <laughs> <laughs> there were... There were Huh? I, 
There are a lot of details here. I believe roosters are chickens. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> yeah, that's the violation. It's not, chickens are not the violation. Okay, it's the it was roosters. roosters were. Sorry, okay, I, I got clarify. you. All right. Well. I feel passionately about chickens, but it was a rooster. I think we need a full report by Dave Kretz tonight. Maybe his pictures. Uh, we have a motion on the floor of Pete to uh, reimburse the 350. Uh, do we have a second? <coughs> If we don't have a second, the motion dies. Motion died. Do we need another motion to refund the $21 to Betty Muncie? Yes. That? Yes. I, would, I would move that we make that refund. All right, do we have a motion to refund uh, Betty Muncie $21? Yes, I so move. Do we have a second? A second, that. A motion, probably second. Any more discussion? All in favor of that motion, show by the sign saying aye. 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 Not opposed. Motion so carried. Okay. Hmm. All right. Next, uh, Betty, I guess you got the budget transfer request. Thank you. This budget transfer request comes along with a new contract to pre-purchase days at the Colonial Group home for, um, this is the non-secure detention facility that um, kids from Middlesex are placed in by the juvenile court judge um, and we have I can't remember how much money we normally have budgeted for that but we have gone over that amount um, we've exceeded the the amount of days that we've already pre-purchased um, so we would like to to purchase an additional <coughs> 166 days for twenty-five thousand dollars. If I may ask, Mr. Chair, at what point in the year are we that we went over? Are we ten We've days? Just, in? just gone over. But we're, we're we're halfway through that year, or are we? Do you know, like in a three hundred sixty-five day year, whether it's January through December or July through June, how far are we through the year when we crossed into realizing we overshot our yearly budget? Nine months. We're nine months in. Mm -hmm. And what? How many days did we in, oh, envision? Six, seven, eight. Sorry? How many more do we No, no. Uh, it looks using? like we're, we're purchasing an additional 166. Yes. At three quarters of the way through the year, what, what would, how badly did we miss our forecast is what I'm trying to understand. Did we say 1,000 oh. and we're... It, it just depends. We started out with two children in, and now we have only have one. So, you know, I just... It's hard to it's, quantify based on yeah. how the judge is going to uh, allocate the no, sentence. But, but what uh, if, if they go to Merrimack and that's one cost, if it's non secure detention, that's another. So you're, you're defending before I attack. Oh, no, it's <laughs> just an explanation. What, what I'm asking for is what did we budget? How many days did we budget of Merrimack? Oh, uh, and, and I mean, if we budgeted 10 days and now we're buying 166, that looks crazy. If, if we budgeted 1,000 and now we're at 166, oh, no, my think, memory serves the budgeted third. maximum amount that they offered us. In anticipation of um, I think this is, them this is last at year. least our this is our third purchase of days or third re up. Yes. So we because because and the reason I'm bringing it to you is because we we didn't have the money in the budget to cover this. Right. So that's right. why. And, and so we, this is a transfer out of contingency. To not to the defense you were offering for the attack that you knew was forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Is, is it our sense that the judge has changed stance on how they're sentencing, or is it that we're having an uh, anomaly of a year in terms of how many delinquents are needing this facility? <coughs> I think it's both. Okay. Uh, I, I think we have more juveniles going to the Merrimack Detention Center, which is pretty costly. Mm. And the Colonial Group Home is a less costly, non-secure option. Uh, I think it's a combination of both. I think we have um, juveniles going to both in greater abundance. I'm ready to make a motion, Mr. Chair, if you're ready. All right. Uh, for budget transfer request form FY 2020-7, do we have a motion uh, to approve that? So moved. We have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. We have a motion, but probably second. Any more discussion? All in favor <coughs> of that motion, show by sign saying aye. 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 None opposed, motion so carried. All right, and then get off to the next one. 
Uh, committee report, uh, committee, uh, board committee appointment. Betty, we got another one here. Well, you see before you, you have um, the appointment memo that Susan has prepared. Um, we have um, for the wetlands board, they, they have, um, they have always had this, well, I shouldn't say they've always had this alternate. They have had an alternate vacancy that has never been filled um, since that was established. Um, and, and we have someone who has submitted an application um, to be on the wetlands board that should you choose to appoint her, she would um, fill that spot as an alternate. And that, that alternate position is there in case a member is not able to attend a meeting. Um, they would give notice to the chairman and the chairman would call the alternate to come in and sit. So they have all the powers that a regular um, wetlands board member would have. Um, we've just never had anyone uh, submit an application to, to, uh, to be on that. I think it's safe to say the wetlands board would want this person nominated or appointed as an alternate. Mr. Chair, are we considering all of the current applicants in one round, or are we doing them individually? I think well, there's ten. We can. Or so. Well, I think we had the we got, uh, next round separately. Right. Okay, yeah. Okay. separately because yeah. That. Okay. All right. So do we have? An, I have a motion for the uh, wetland board. Uh, was it Gene Rehm? So mm -hmm. moved that we approve Gene Rehm to the wetland board alternate position. Do we have a second? Second. So we, got, we got a motion and probably second. Any more discussion? All in favor of the motion, show by the sign saying aye. 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 None opposed, motion so carried. All right, next. Well, we, um, we advertised for applicants for the sewer study committee with um, a deadline of the last Monday, the 24th, and received one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, applica ten applicants for that. So, um, I don't, I don't believe a formal action had been taken by the board to determine how many or anything. I'm assuming well, that's something, that that's something that, you're going to yeah. have that committee determine tonight. Ahead. Have some recommendations. Okay. <clears throat> First, um, we were really delighted at the level of interest from uh, citizens of many different backgrounds and experience. We've got a huge talent pool in this county, and I was delighted that they stepped up to be a part of this. Here's how I recommend that we go about this study. And just to refresh everybody on the background, the Hampton Road Sewer District has proposed that they would um, manage a sewer collection system in addition to the force main that they will own and put in at their own expense. But the collection systems with all the different population areas, <clears throat> multiple population areas in some uh, er some geographic <coughs> areas, like Deltaville has four population areas, for example, that were identified by Hampton Road Sewer District. So HRSD has said, if we put every collection system in every location using the technology that we are comfortable maintaining, the cost is going to be about $55 million. 32 million of which would be Deltaville four zones. That's just too much money. Um, and their system is intended to be minimal maintenance for them, of course, so they're signing up to maintain the system. They would rather spend the capital up front, our, our capital up front, so that the maintenance expense ongoing is much lower. Well, that's just too much for us to swallow. We believe that there are other options that we can propose to the Board of Supervisors that would be much less upfront capital. They may be reduced scope. We may not need four zones in a population area. Maybe two zones would solve 70 percent of the problem. The technology that they've recommended um, in Deltaville is a vacuum system. In the other areas is a gravity, gravity. system. 
there are other technologies, something called a step system where there's pumping and, and maceration involved. None of those alternative technologies are on the table from HRSD. So the purpose of this committee, and I'm going to call it committee phase one, is we would like to spend the next 60 to 90 days with a committee comprised of people with technical backgrounds to come up with recommendations as to the technologies that we recommend, the locations that we recommend, and the amount of money that those options would, would entail. So as an example, it would be nice for this committee to provide two or three scenarios. One might be $20 million, one might be $30 million, one might be $40 million, and here's what you get for those trade-offs so that the board could consider the best way to go ahead, at which point we would disband the technology committee and we would likely, assuming we decide to go ahead, we would form a sewer committee phase two which would conduct oversight, do our requests for proposals, um, would evaluate whether we need to have some sort of ongoing public works type function in the county or outsourced, all those issues. So the phase one is uh, we recommend that that just be a technical recommendation committee, 60 to 90 days. And for that reason, Pete and I um, would like to recommend five individuals who volunteered who have strong technical or uh, on-the-job experience with exactly this kind of problem. Our intent is to manage the meetings as work sessions, so we invite all of those who are interested and who volunteered to participate in those technology sessions so that everybody's up to speed when we go to phase two and look at how we're going to implement. And, uh, but we really would like to keep the voting members of the committee to seven just to make it manageable. And so the, the five individuals that we recommend to be on the technology phase one committee are Mike Kidd, uh, Brian Miller, Ted Povar, Ron Ritchie, and Greg Chambers. We will uh, of course, invite all of the other, the, the other five volunteers and, of course, the public to these meetings and um, encourage their participation in these meetings. And I would like to target having our recommendations by the end of this fiscal year, June 30. That's my recommendation. Okay. We do, would that be your more? We need a motion on that? Well, that, that would be your motion for those? That's my motion. Okay. I second. We have a motion, and it have been probably second. All in favor of that motion, show by the sign saying aye. 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 None opposed. Motion so carried. Were we supposed to vote on that? <coughs> you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're ready. All right. Okay. Uh, sewer, the sewer option alternative study committee, Matt. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I, I think Lud said it very well. The only thing I'd have to add is we're probably going to try to schedule our first meeting later this week to get started early, either this week or next week. I can get with the membership and we can uh, kind of poll the membership and see when they want to try to get together. And we'll, of course, let the media know and post that. Okay. All right, next will be nine item six, uh, county administrator update. Apologize for no written report in your packet. I have just a couple of items. Uh, first, Middlesex Water Authority update. The Water Authority went to public hearing for a quick take of several private roads where, in which we needed easements over where the private road ownership was somehow questionable and um, uh, the ability to convey an easement from questionable ownership that doesn't exist. So the normal process is to take those right away through a quick claim uh, process through the courts. Uh, the Water Authority held a public hearing. 
uh, voted to move forward with that for, uh, that uh, endeavor with the exception of one of the advertised roads being Sun <coughs> Sand Beach because it was advertised as Susan Beach and Crossrip and Crossrip because there were some minor adjustments mm -hmm. to the amount of right of way that we needed along that private road. Um, if there are any questions on the water authority, and I'll have a lot more to report next month. And there's another public hearing additional roads on the 18th of this month. There you go. Okay. So we're going after the roadways and trying to keep the easements we need on roadways whenever possible practical. Uh, also, uh, we were successful in getting a reassessment RFP on the street. Uh, as of now, Matthews and King and Queen County want to participate with us. We have a pre-bid meeting scheduled with the other two counties. Uh, our Commissioner of Revenue's office has been invited to attend the pre-bid meeting on March 13th to help um, answer questions about the proposal. Um, several of you who were on the board last time remember the process. We had a, a selection committee made up of county administrators and the Commissioners of Revenue from the counties. Uh, we uh, solicited for the service of reassessment and of course we interviewed the candidates hope to have uh, RFPs uh, back by the end of the month and depending on our other county partners a recommendation to this board in April on selection of a potential reassessment firm and then last but not least I've got good news if I can pull it up <coughs> our lodging tax bill did not fall victim to politics this year it has made its way through both the House and the Senate has been signed by the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate it's my understanding it now goes to the governor for signature for authorization to be implemented July 1st in your packet as my written report is a draft lodging tax ordinance that pretty much affects the state code requirements uh, of the additional rate um, <coughs> it would be my recommendation that the board advertise uh, the uh, the transit <coughs> occupancy tax pretty much as drafted knowing that if you did not want to adopt the full five percent rate after the public hearing you can always step back but you can't increase the rate you couldn't increase the rate above five percent regardless because the uh, state hasn't allowed that they've allowed us up to five percent but if you advertise it at five percent and then decide for some reason to do four you can always come down uh, you have a copy of the ordinance in your packet uh, you're here to answer any questions you may have on that but it would be my recommendation go ahead and send that to public hearing in April or May and have it be made effective July 1. We need a motion on it. Uh, if I may. All right. Can we have, to have a motion? I, I, Mr. Chairman, if I may add my two cents, I, there's a slight disagreement between the county administrator and I. I think it should go to public hearing once the governor has actually signed it. Okay. Um, it, it's a nuance, but you can do either one. But we won't know when that is until he actually signs it. Right now, it is not a law. It is just a passed bill. It will not become a law in which you can actually enact until the governor signs it. I'm going to listen to my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Which should happen by April, but I'm fine with that. May is fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I do agree with everything else. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you finished? That's yes, it? Yes, sir. Sorry. That's all I had. <laughs> County attorney update. That was kind of my thunder there. Oh, well. <laughs> so I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will just expand a little bit. You will notice on the transient occupancy tax, um, you'll notice that I did make some changes throughout this, and those are underlined. There were a couple of minor things, um, just some changes that I noticed where we said article instead of ordinance. It was just some housekeeping things. But beyond that, the main change was under Section 3, where we added um, that anything over the 2% has to be used for tourism, traveling, um, marketing, or other initiatives like that. And we have to consult with our local tourism industry uh, to discuss that. But that was it, Mr. Chairman. And then the other thing is what Betty said about water. We'll be having another quick take hearing on March 18th for the Water Authority. Um, we have, I want to say, Betty, do you remember? Is it, it's more than about a half dozen private roads. Um, and this is where we're not able to locate the owner of the property. And the authority will be continuing with those procedures. Okay. All right. Now, we have any 
unfinished business. Anyone? I, I would just offer an update on the Mill Creek boat landing. We are still working uh, with DGIF, NOAA, and other agencies to determine if we can get their permission in conjunction with VDOT to go in and use some local contractors uh, to clean out temporarily that landing before the summer traffic gets in here and hopefully as soon as possible so that we can accommodate the, the watermen that have been inconvenienced. So we're we're still working on that, but I am learning what red tape looks like firsthand and it's uh, it's not fun. That's all filled in now, isn't it? Yeah, it's totally filled in. Wow. Right, right. I mean, you, you couldn't get a John boat out of there. My hold up is that you're not allowed to dredge this time of year because of fish it spawn. was. We were able to clear that hurdle. Now we need to go and do a surveying underwater of what it looks like now. And I think in part that determines what, to what extent we can impact it. Uh, but there, there may still be a second species. I can't remember the name of the two different. One was a fish and one is something else. But uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has to give us a blessing to let us dredge after February 15th and before June something. I think we're going to clear that hurdle, but we still, once we clear that hurdle, need to then go and get somebody to come out and survey, and we still need approval from VDOT, who owns the land, and DGIF, who is administering the boat ramp. I think DGIF is compliant. They want to see this work out, especially given all the volunteer <coughs> labor and equipment and manpower. Um, <coughs> Just suffice it to say, I'm, I'm not there yet, but we're, we're fighting on it. Mm. Okay. Oh, any new business? Anyone? No new business. All right. Is that the case? Uh, matters presented by the board. I'm going to start with you, Reggie. <coughs> your your board, board reports for this month? Well, uh, <coughs> I attended the planning, uh, Middle Peninsula Planning Committee and meeting, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning things from it all the time. Kind of like wait, wait, wait for voters on the soul bounce. Yeah, I forgot out the out the meeting because it looked like it's something going to be coming down the road that it kind of could get some revenue from that. I also went to the uh, YMCA Impact Dunham uh, we had over there and in uh, the and, and news, and I found that very helpful. You know, meeting different people and getting on. And like the uh, superintendent said, I went to the Black History Program. Uh, which they had at the uh, middle school. I, I found that pretty interesting because anytime you go back on history, it's pretty good because the truth is very important. And saying to see kids that get uh, finding out that hey, dad is something different than what I heard it makes it pretty interesting. You know, so uh, that's basically what I've done. I also met with the airport committee and they got ideas and I'm content to talk to different ones about, you know, the airport, you know, so, but, uh, that's just about it. Okay, John? Uh, as I mentioned, I've been working on Mill Creek and that's been a lot of phone and email back and forth. Uh, had our jail board meeting, uh, Middle Peninsula Regional Security Center. Uh, I also got to see the Middlesex Elementary School uh, Black History Month's uh, Wax Museum. And they, they would have a little button and, and the kids would sit there like this. <laughs> some, of them, some of them. My son was like, I'm done with that. <laughs> and then you hit the button and they would start reciting the, the, their whole story. It was, it was it was awesome. Uh, I've also been working with COSARS, uh, the Coalition of Small and Rural Schools, uh, advocating for some of the things in the General Assembly that could deeply impact uh, the cost of doing business in our county. I think if I've learned anything in two years on this board, uh, there's a limit to how much you can raise rural taxes. Uh, at some point, somebody has to go to Richmond and fight for the dollars that we should be getting from Richmond that don't all need to go to Northern Virginia. So I've, I've sort of shifted in, in my thinking there. Um, but I think COSAR is a great place to sort of line up with other regional or uh, rural communities all, all over the, the Commonwealth. I mean, I've, I've gotten to know a superintendent out in Bristol. Uh, I've gotten to know uh, some of the lobbyists that are in Richmond. And we're not the only ones that have this problem. In fact, most counties, we saw this with the Second Amendment sanctuary. <coughs> People really are rural, and there's a lot of us. We're just not close to each other. Uh, and so it's all about banding together and, and getting representation in Richmond. And I'm, I'm going to try to do more of that uh, next year in, in, the, in the assembly. Um, 
been working on the electric school bus and, and I just want to respond to some of the public comments. Those chargers, I wish they were $900. They're about $92,000 and the installation and the hardware are all paid for by Dominion uh, in part of that grant. And, and I do, you know, just briefly respond to some of the concern. I mean, we're right to have concern. There's not a lot of electric school buses uh, out in the communities. Uh, it makes us leaders, and sometimes that can mean uh, folly. It can mean unintended consequences. Um, but working in this industry, uh, I, can, I can tell you this, this is, we're going to see a lot of electric school buses, and a lot of the risk has been de-risked by a utility that is much more uh, incentivized to do something like this because we couldn't afford to do this without the $392,000 of grant money. It would not even be remotely feasible. But the promise of having a cleaner fleet with less emissions in our kids' lungs and our administration's lungs and our teachers' lungs with safety belts and lower operating costs both in fuel and maintenance uh, and the additional ancillary benefit to the utility that motivates them to the point that they're willing to invest $392,000 in Middlesex schools. Again, I'm looking for places outside of our taxpayers to find money. We just found $392,000 from outside of Middlesex. So if you don't want me to raise taxes and you don't want me to find money from outside of the county, I need your third idea. Um, <laughs> after that, I've been working with the joint school and uh, county Board of Supervisors Finance Committee uh, on a couple meetings, and then we've had budget work sessions as well. Uh, I think someone alluded to, I think Trudy, you alluded to this being a really busy time. We're almost uh, the end of the busy time. This is, for me, the first quarter of the year is the hardest quarter for supervisor. I really enjoyed the July time frame when nobody's coming in here because there's not much to talk about and business has already sort of been laid out for the year, but this, this is the crunch time. And so um, and I also went to the courthouse and got a marriage license, and that worked very smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I, I did attend the wedding. I was there, and it was cold on that pier, but uh, it was a very nice wedding. <laughs> well, John, also I wanted to announce that uh, even with the buses, uh, and, and, and in there a warranty that goes along with it. If the battery goes down or if you have a motor problem, doesn't uh, Dominion? energy take care of that or something like that because I know a lot of people were wondering you know what happens if the battery goes out within 20 years or whatever yeah it, explain it, that th there is a warranty on both the powertrain and the battery I think the best thing that we could do is encourage folks to go to Dominion's website and and enter electric school buses FAQs frequently asked questions they're getting these questions from the 50 bus recipients and the other 1,500 that wanted to be in this program but didn't make the cut because they didn't move as quickly as Middlesex did, they're getting lots of these questions. And so there's already a frequently asked question signed uh, uh, page on Dominion's electric school buses uh, initiative. And it, it really does a pretty good job. In fact, uh, I think from the school board session, there were two or three speakers that had questions. And while I was sitting up here, I saw Dr. Gretz emailing our, our contact at Dominion asking him, do you have answers to these questions? And I responded, here are the FAQs from Dominion's website. And Dr. Gretz looked at them and said, yep, that addresses what those two constituents had. So we're not saying we won't address those questions, but we're saying Dominion's already done a lot of homework on this, and they're getting a lot more questions than we might be getting just from our county. So they're going to address answers to questions you might not have even had. So if you, if you go to dominion.com and look up electric school buses and FAQs, um, that'll, that'll give you a, a clear record of, of some of the answers to the questions that are burning in people's minds about this. All right. Okay, thanks. Pete? Well, I attended the sewer committee meeting and I felt it was very, very good. And I look forward to, to uh, doing some work on that. But I do have a question for John concerning the school buses. What is uh, the cost of the power stations? Do we pay for those or? The, the charging stations? Yeah, charging so stations. So there's, there's two charging stations. Okay. Each will be able to accommodate four buses at some point in the future. Oh, so, okay. So getting two gets us the ability to charge eight, I believe. Again, I would push everybody to the Dominion website, but the cost, as I understand it, for the hardware itself, the two chargers, which are about the size of a, of a refrigerator each, so they're likely going to go out at St. Clair Walker in that parking lot. Um, 
we already had a coordination meeting where they saw the transformer they're going to pull off. I think it's just 480 volts, pretty simple inter, uh, interconnection. Um, but they're like two big fridges, and they're going to be 20 feet apart, and the buses are going to come in at a diagonal. And I think we opted for the 18-foot charging <coughs> cord. The, the chargers in the, in the buses are on the passenger side. I can't remember if it's passenger or driver's side, but it's right behind the door or the window, depending on which side you are. But those are a $92,000 uh, capital expense. And then there is some installation costs, but talking to the four or five Dominion people that were there on site about our location, it's one of the easiest ones they have. So they're, they're pretty excited about how little it's going to cost them. But either way, it's not coming to the county. But, uh, but Dominion's paying for the charging stations also? Correct. They're paying. The, the, the very simplified, high-level version of this is they're paying for the charging stations, the installation cost of the charging stations, and the difference between what we're used to paying for diesel and what it costs to buy electric for two buses. Now, where it gets yep. slightly convoluted is we have a $98,000 line item in for our annual diesel bus purchase. That probably could have stood to go up anyway as those prices have gone up and we've started to, to uh, buy more options in those buses. But because Dominion's a big utility and the big utilities of the world talk about safety before everything else, they felt that they couldn't in good conscience be buying buses and getting into the bus world without putting seat belts in them. So that became an adder that we're not used to buying and there's all kinds of stuff. If you, if you research this, you'll find people that run bus departments that swear everyone should have a seat belt and you'll find people on the far extreme that say uh, they're actually more dangerous. Uh, so that's out there. You'll find that if you research long enough. But, but Dominion is the one footing the bulk, well, I shouldn't say that. Dominion's putting out the capital. The capital's coming from ratepayers who, who buy electricity, and that's all approved through the State Corporation Commission in Virginia. But the point is they're shepherding the money towards the bus program, and they as Dominion wanted seatbelts. So it wasn't just a straight 98,000 that we're used to paying. Finally, last point, uh, we couldn't not pull the trigger on a diesel bus in December. That's when we buy, that's when we leverage buying with other counties. So we had just bought a diesel when we found out we're getting two electric buses. So what that means is we're going to have to pull in two diesel buses, turn them into electric buses, and then not be buying buses for two years. So it, it, net net we're paying for seat belts and we're, we're buying buses two years earlier than we normally would have. It's, it's kind of the net of the transaction. Yeah. Well, I think you've done an excellent job on getting getting that for us. Thank you, Pete. And I thank you. I vote. I um, had a regular meeting with the Water Authority. We, uh, Pete and I, formed the Sewer Study Committee. <clears throat> we, um, I served on the Bus Maintenance Facility Committee jointly with the school board. So we've wrapped up that effort and concluding that we're not going to go ahead with that facility at this time. Um, I attended the school board public budget presentation and then uh, Pete and I yesterday spent the day meeting with the ELS campground company to make sure that we got our arms around that project and could share citizen concerns with them. All right, thank you. Yeah, I did attend the Vaco Educational or Chairman Institute. That was uh, very educational. You know, as you know, it de deal with Robert rules in small settings, and because uh, you know that can you can go a long ways with Robert rules. For, uh, but uh, that was very educational. But also, they talked about you know budgeting and finance, and you go through different scenarios. But it's great to, to to meet with other localities and see how they run their business and do things because. I can say I do like the way that Matt puts the dollar bill up because you know when we do the budget, it breaks that dollar bill down, letting you know where everything is going when you do a budget. Because a lot of uh, uh, counties still do that graph, the circle graph that they put in. But when you break the dollar down, you know you can really see it. And I'm glad uh, Matt's doing it like that. It makes it a little more uh, easy to read. Also, I did uh, attend the Middle Peninsula Planning District. Uh, we adopted Middle Peninsula Regional Priority List, and well, that's what we do normally every so many years. Also, I did uh, attend the uh, YMCA Impact Dinner, and uh, also, and I, I did, as I said earlier, the school, uh, elementary school that was educational too, with Black History, and that is it for my committee reports. At this time. Where are we at now? Best part of the meeting. Yeah, do we have a motion to recess until 7 p.m.? So moved. 
Second. second. Have a motion, probably second. All in favor of the motion, so by the sign saying aye. 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 All righty. Thank you, Mr. Public Chairman. Hand. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all if right. I may, uh, in working with Mr. Kretz and Ms. Lewis, we've come up with an idea as to a way that would address the concerns that you've voiced and also allow the application to move forward tonight. And if I could lay that out. Um, Ms. Lewis advises that uh, as county attorney, she feels that you are in a position to grant approval for some additional conditions. Those would be by way of my proffers, my agreement tonight. They would later be written into the recorded agreement. Here's what we would propose those would be. Number one, uh, the applicant would agree to uh, address the Town Bridge and Old Virginia intersection repair by removing the island and widening the right turn radius, subject to VDOT approval. If VDOT did not approve that as a fix, they said you can't change that intersection we would have our approval and would move forward secondly we would proffer a golf cart management program at Beth Page which would involve signage and an in-house policy probably on our website which would be approved by the county at the site plan level Third, similarly, we would proffer a no-wake zone education plan at Beth Page. Signage, information on the website, designed to try to bring our guests better in compliance with the marine boating laws. And finally, in response to your questions, we would adjust the proffers uh, with the county attorney and the director of planning and zoning agreement to clarify the opaque buffer definition and have that reasonable grow in that you questioned Mr. Lett about. And that in return I would respectfully suggest Mr. Chairman would allow the board to uh, be comfortable moving the approval tonight and keep our plan moving ahead but still to address these issues that you've expressed and the citizens have voiced tonight. Okay. All right. All right, well, I will thank you for that right now. So now I'm going to have to close the public hearing, and then we're going to open it back up to the board. I have a motion, if you'll accept it. All right, well, I'm, I'm, open, I'm opening it up to the board now uh, for, for some discussion, and then we can have a motion. Uh, Heather? I, I'm so sorry. I know Mr. Davis just sat down, but I'm, I was a little, I just had a question, Mr. Chairman, about this last proffer to clarify the opaque buffer uh, with reasonable that growth what was the last one now? reasonable grow in period growing period okay that would be subject to the planning director's approval this is not an attempt to get a 10-year grow in but it's an attempt <laughs> to be able to plant trees closely enough together that they are screening but they don't die because they're so dense to to the question we had So respectfully, I, I think the proffers that are proposed, and we have that language, maybe we can pull that up, it already says uh, that the buffers shall be designed and planted so as to create an opaque buffer, or so as to screen and block the visibility of the campers, cottages, buildings, and activities of the property. Um, I, I'm not objecting if that's what you want to add, I, I guess my I just need clarification on what exactly it is that Mr. Kretz and I would be reviewing that for because to me you've already proffered that and then the site plan will specify the specific items that will be planted. Um, if there's further opaqueness that we need to define that might need to be discussed now so that I have guidance because I think you've already done that unless I'm misunderstanding. So what I've said earlier is we're ready to proffer an opaque buffer. Mr. Lett said earlier, in the ideal world, you have a reasonable grow-in period to allow those trees to flourish, overlap, and become truly opaque. Doesn't mean that you plant parsley and wait 10 years. There's a little bit of a disconnect between uh, opaque the day they're planted versus some sort of reasonable grow-in period and I'm looking for an opportunity for, with Mr. Kretz's expertise, 
the input of our landscape architect to define a reasonable time period when that buffer becomes opaque and can also be planted logically so that the, the plantings thrive. And I, I think your landscape ar architect was suggesting a year would probably uh, give us that opaqueness. I guess my hesitation is that's a really broad decision for the county attorney and the zoning administrator. From a legal standpoint, I don't have so much to say on that, and I'm looking to the board. If you give us uh, some direction on what that should be, then staff can implement it. But to just give such a broad sweep on that, I, I am a little reluctant as your counsel to say that stipulation <laughs> meets that requirement. I think they're trying to meet what you're asking right. for. I'm not trying to be a hang-up here, but... Mm -hmm. I don't have enough guidance to be able to help draft that legally is what I'm saying. Okay. Well, so keep going. am I correct uh, that in your your best interest, it would you get at least 95% opaqueness, if there is such a word, after a year? <coughs> Produce your opaqueness meter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, if planted and designed properly, we can demonstrate opacity through the plan process. Um, so we will have that opportunity by developing final plans, and then we can demonstrate the, the expectation for opacity. And would you include the word one year? Yes, one grow-in period. Yeah. So, so we, to further embellish this discussion, we limit when we allow a landscape contractor to plant. We won't let a landscape contractor plant plants in July. Mm -hmm. So generally the cutoff is um, June to um, October, just the heating period that you don't want new vegetation trying to establish. So one grow in period I think would be a comfortable um, comfortable terminology to use to address a question. So 12 to 16 months. Yeah, if you plant it in October, say, of 20, of, of 2020, and, and um, yeah, 12 to 16, to 18 case, months. The worst case scenario is you got the green light in June, then couldn't plant till October. Correct. And go a whole nother year. Right. And that would be more like 16 I months. I think 18 would be, yeah. So 16. 16, 18, yes. Uh, that's part of your motion. I understand yeah. that it can help draft that. I just thank you. Yeah. I needed that guidance. Okay. My, if I may, the only question I have is, is you addressed four out of the five things that I was looking for, not to be a, a, a pain in the tail, but just like you are proposing a golf cart plan, I'd like to see articulated your sewer plan because there are some options out there that may come to pass in terms of what the public uh, provides to the campground. I, I don't think it's a major ask, but I think if we're gonna approve tonight, we'd, we'd like to know that that sewer plan is also something that you would proffer, that you do have, in fact, three or four different alternatives based on whether there's a new treatment plant in Urbana or there's a, a, a new uh, main line going all the way back down to York County uh, or, or, or what have you. But but for me, it's a, it's a five-fold proffer that I can make a motion for at this point. So just so we're clear, the law requires that we have a sewage option before we build, before we get site plan approval. So I think the law says what you're saying, if I understand you, Mr. Coon, so I, I don't have any problem with the proffer. I, and and I, I didn't think you would. I just would point out that the law, <laughs> how do I say this? I mean, we've, we've got our delegate in Richmond right now trying to get the laws improved to address septic leaching into our bay waters. And uh, we're at the mercy of those that make our laws that we think or at least our delegate thinks are inadequate and he's having trouble getting those passed because he knows of some septic issues that we have out here and uh, so yes normally I would defer to the law as being adequate uh, but it just so happens on this particular instance uh, I'm concerned that we have a bigger issue with septic and I don't want anyone else in our shores or within our county boundaries uh, contributing further to the problem that we're seeing. We've had uh, some of our oyster grounds closed, um, and right now that's all 
being under the current laws. So, so there are some laws that probably need addressed and it's not happening as fast as I'd like. So I, I'd just like to make sure you're aware that that's an issue that faces our community uh, and it's not being as addressed as quickly, at, at least as I'd like, by our uh, representation in Richmond outside of Delegate Hodges. So John, to facilitate the, excuse me. I'm going to ask John, if I recommend that we have a condition that we review site plans with the Planning Commission, which would give us oversight of septic plans. And does that solve your discomfort? As long as you're holding on to the other four proffers, I think you're you're the guy to make a motion. <laughs> yeah, so I would, well, do we, I'll make a motion that we can have any further discussion unless anybody wants any other proffer elements. Right. Anybody got any more? If not, let's get this one. On yeah. Thing. Okay. So I would move that we accept the uh, four additional proffers that were just explained to us and also with the condition that the Planning Commission review with the Board of Supervisors the site plans when those are presented. You Second. have those four, four proffers written down, um, Helen? With, with the 16-month growing season. Right, okay. Yes. Well, just go, just go over those four real oh. quick and then we have it. Uh, okay, so I have that uh, the applicant will add that they will address the Crown Boots Road intersection They'll remove the island and widen the right turn radius, subject to VDOT approval. They will add a proffer for golf cart management, which will include signage and in-house policy. Um, and there will also uh, a, a no-wake zone education, which will include signage and update on the website. And a proffer to clarify the opaque buffer uh, with a reasonable growing period, which shall be defined as 16 months. Okay, all right. Right, did I catch it all? Make sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Lud has that motion on the floor. We second. Have a second by John. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. And the last one was to include the BOS site plan. I missed okay. one. Sorry. Right. Now I'll second. So we have thank a motion you. and been probably second. Any more discussion? All in favor of that motion show by the sign saying aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion so carried. Move that we adjourn? No, no, there's public comment. Damn. Public comment. <laughs> Sorry. This is just open public comment. Right. We got the last thing we have would be public Thank comment. You. We have anyone who'd like to address the board at this time? Okay. Hello. Mr. Chairman, board members, I'm not quite sure what is this cart management is all about. I would like to hear more about what is what is the golf cart management is all about. That's you're not going into detail of what that means. Could you give me a more definite definition of what golf cart management means? Thank you. All right, thank you. We have anyone else that'd like to address the board? Can I just address the if we can hear you. Okay. okay. Thank you. We have anyone else address the board? If oh, okay, come on up quick. Oh, I'm just trying to <laughs> add the, the point about the um, putting things on a website, thinking that that's going to solve a problem. Uh, it, it's, it appears to me to be weak. I mean that it, it has to be fortified a little bit more than we're just going to put this on the website in terms of golf carts and uh, boating and so forth. I, I, I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that putting it on a website. There, they could be in their contractual language when somebody um, I don't, rents a site that they have to agree to abide by the policies which include the golf cart, voting, etc. I just wanted to add to that. And I really appreciate the board's concern about our quality of life here and smart growth and uh, the, the, the problems that we already know with the um, golf cart, I mean the, the carts, and uh, really um, it, it already negatively affects the residents. So we know with more people, 
probability is going to increase. And so your point earlier about law enforcement, that all needs to be addressed. So I thank you all so much for your care and your consideration. Thank you. Have anyone else? If not, so uh, uh, here come a comment and close. And do we have a? I do have one quick point. All right. Uh, upcoming meetings. Several of the board members are attending the new board members uh, institute on March 20th and 21st. Just want to disclose that for the record. I think we have three members attending. Right. If anyone else wants to attend, let staff know. We'll get you. And uh, March 20th and the 21st. 21st. Right, right. Okay. All right. Oh, and you have a meeting the budget on the work session on the 24th. March 24th. Okay, keep that all in mind. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Motion probably second. All in favor saying aye. Aye. aye.